Hey guys, it is Monday morning. Our baby bettas are now just over a week old, week and a half, close. Thursday, they will be two weeks old. Our guppies are all doing good. Our Daphne Coulter is making a comeback. I don't know if we'll be able to see it. Look, Daphne, they're moving. They exist. So happy. <laughs> Our baby bed is over here. Let's see, they will be eight weeks old tomorrow. And they are doing really, really well. Where is this guy? There he is. This is our favorite. He's so pretty. We went ahead and went through them, me and my daughter. Labeled them all. Got them priced for sale. So... We know what they're going to be. Right now we're doing pet beta fish would be $10. You know, ones that like aren't even nearly perfect. Ones that have like uneven fins, stuff like that. Um, the ones that are closer to being better for breeding, ones that have really good top lines or really good finnage, will be $15. And then there's two in here that are our absolute favorites that we kind of want to keep. Um, we're pricing them at $20 because they are the best of the best of the group. There is that male I just showed you. And this female, where is she? There she is. She is our favorite if she will come around. There she is. She's a blue marble. And she's just pretty. We like her. We do have some odd ones in this group. We have... One female that we think is koi. Most of ours that marbled are turning just marble, blue marble, blue metallic marble. But we have one that has a very defined pattern that we think is a koi. We also have one male in here somewhere. Not sure where he is. That looks like he's going to be a placot. All of our other ones have really long fins. He is definitely a male. But his fins are half the size of all the others. So, I don't know how that happened. We'll take it. But they're doing really, really well. All our guppies are doing well. All our snails are doing well. We now have 17 egg clutches from these snails. Like, it's crazy. Every other day or so, we wake up and find one of these so we've just been sticking them in this incubator and letting them incubate let's go take a look at our baby 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 bettas they're getting huge I don't remember the other group being this big at this age but for a week and a few days, they're massive. They're getting their pectorals already. They have their caudal fins in. They're too big for microworms. They're eating brine shrimp. But they could probably eat grindle worms at this stage. Like, my god, they grew. What I really wanted to talk about today with you guys, though, is cultures. We haven't checked in on our live cultures in a while. And I really wanted to get into more depth with you guys about, you know, how I keep them, some of the things I've learned keeping them. <laughs> because I remember when I first got into all of this fish stuff for my daughter's homeschool, and we were considering, you know, are we just going to buy fish food because that seems easier? <laughs> or are we going to live culture foods, learn a little more, um, never have to buy fish food again? <laughs> and 
And we, we went with live culturing and I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be so much work. It's gonna be hard. What if I can't keep my cultures alive? What if, you know, they all crash and I run out of fish food? What's gonna happen? Like I was super nervous about it. But then I got into it and it's like so easy. You guys, live culturing is so much easier than everybody like presents it to be. When you first get into it, you think, oh my God, it's gonna be so terrible. There's gonna be bugs everywhere. There's all these supplies I have to buy, but like the maintenance is negligible. There's so little maintenance to these. I mean, sure, a couple minutes every morning, I spend five, 10 minutes just checking my cultures in the morning, but most of the time I don't have to do anything with them. I just look at them. I make sure they're okay and then I move on. Every couple of days I have to do something like feed one or, you know, reculture one once a week or once every three weeks or once every couple of months. Like, it's not a big deal. So I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about it because I feel like not a lot of fish keepers go the route of having all live cultured foods, especially for bettas. People just feed them flakes and pellets and whatever, and that's fine. I mean, they live off that stuff. But like, if you can live culture food, it's so much healthier for your fish. And they will really like show you how much better it is for them. I mean, you guys have seen our babies. They have just grown like crazy. I don't have to worry about our fish having fin rot or anything like that. They haven't gotten sick. And when they do get fin rot, it's gone with like a week, within a week. They grow, you know, an inch of finage in a week. That's insane. So I just wanted to kind of show you guys some of the stuff I've learned. Number one thing, you'll notice as I've mentioned before, we keep our live cultures upstairs in a separate room than our fish because most of these you do not want in high humidity because it'll mold. So we actually keep this. We have, you guys haven't seen this room well before. This is a guest room we haven't put together. There's usually like a mattress in here, but we have it downstairs at the moment. So like, it's just an extra room. We don't use it anything for anything. There's our internet. Like, this is used for nothing. So, over here, we keep this tub. We keep all of our cultures upstairs in this tub. And the bottom is lined with this really tacky mite paper. Basically, it's insecticide soaked paper. Any bug that touches this stuff is dead. Like, it can't even get to the other cultures. It just dies pretty much instantly. This stuff is toxic, but it's great. Because I know that since this mite paper is in here and this tub is here, there is no way any insect in, this cult, in any of these cultures is going to get out. It's just not going to happen. Every once in a while, I'll find, I'll find, like, a dead beetle down here in the bottom of the mite paper. But, like, nothing is getting out of this culture. So if you have a family or you yourself don't like insects roaming your house and people are worried about it, you know, do this. Deep tub, mite paper. Nothing is getting out. Now, we keep a sifter up here for sifting out mealworms, but this is where we keep most of our beetle cultures. This is our rice flower beetles. And then we have three containers for our mealworms. A great thing about cultures is if you plan right, most of your cultures will basically all use the same ingredients. You feed them all the same things. And so like, it's easy. The supplies are oatmeal, flour, and then you just use that. <laughs> it's so easy. So we keep this little container here for the pupa for our mealworms. You'll notice every single lid we have here has had holes drilled in it and a very fine mesh glued to the other side. 
This is so hopefully the insects can get air, but the insects can't get out. We do this on all our live cultures. It's really easy to DIY. Hot glue gun is what you need. Oh, we have some beetles that hatched. So pupa don't eat, so you don't need to put anything in this. It's just a little tiny container to hold the pupa separately from the beetles and the mealworms because they will eat them if you leave them in. So basically these cultures with the mealworms and the darkling beetles basically contain the same things. This is literally a little bit of oatmeal, just old fashioned oats, nothing special about it. You can get it really cheap at Walmart. You just throw it in, you throw your beetles in or your mealworms. That's it. Now, here's the thing. You can, and it's recommended, throw them in veggies. These are some dried up old potatoes. I also throw in, you know, let's see, potato skins, carrots, um, just whatever veggie you have around, apples, banana, peels, uh, any kind of cast off from a veggie or fruit or, you know, a piece of it that isn't too wet. Carrots are really good because they don't mold as quickly as other things. Potatoes get kind of juicy. But you just throw a piece in there. When it dries out, you throw a new piece in there. But you don't have to be specific with it. Like... I have kept this to where I didn't throw any vegetables at all in with the mealworms. They were fine, you guys. They still grew. I do recommend you put them in, though, because if they can't get moisture, they grow a little slower. And also, they will look for that moisture elsewhere, meaning they will cannibalize. So, like, you should put vegetables in, but you don't have to. So like, don't feel bad if one day you realize all of their veggies have been dried up for like two days. Oh no, they have had no water. They're fine. Seriously, they're fine. So, you know, once or twice a week, if that, I'll throw some vegetables in here. Here's some old grody potatoes. That are just absolutely brick hard. So obviously I need to replace these. But that's it. That, that's all the maintenance. <laughs> that's it. Uh, you do want to keep the mealworms and the darkling beetle separate. Because they will cannibalize. So what I do is I keep all the mealworms in here. until, And I checked once a day. Four, come here, these. These are mealworm pupas. When we get these, once a day I pick them out and I throw them in here. And once a day I check this. If there's a beetle that's hatched, I will grab him out, come here buddy. He's like, no, you can't do this one-handed. There. Take them out, put them in there. This is where the beetles go. Now, once every mm, month or so, three weeks, I'll take this, I will take out all the beetles. I just take them out by hand because whatever, it's fine. Grab them, move them to a new container full of oatmeal, and then I dump all of this into another container. Or, you know, even this one. This container contains all the eggs, and they will turn into baby mealworms. And so, after a couple weeks, I will sift them out, and throw them in this container for them to grow. That's it. Uh, but the 
Great thing is, if you do this on a type of schedule, this container will completely empty of mealworms by turning them into pupas before this one is ready to be cleaned. So when it's cleaned, this just becomes a new mealworm bin. And I will just throw all the beetles in this one. Uh, once a week, I will sift this and get all of the, the poop out. It just looks like dust. It's easy to sift. And that's it. That's the maintenance. It's, it's literally nothing. Uh, mealworms are great because the itty bitty baby mealworms can be fed to your bettas and guppies or whatever you keep. Any small fish. The adults can be fed to larger fish. You can also just take a handful of these and blend it up into your gel food for your fish, which is what I do because my fish are not big enough to eat these. But every once in a while, I'll just come in here and I'll, I'll pull out some baby ones and I'll just go feed them to my bettas. They love them. They're great. They squiggle in the water. So let's talk about our next culture and then we'll head downstairs and take a look at the others. I have some I need to redo today. These are rice flour beetles and these have to be one of my favorite live culture foods that I got for bettas. They're not commonly used. Um, these are usually used to feed poison dart frogs and other small reptiles and amphibians. But when I was doing research into small, you know, larva that I could feed my bettas, this came up. Um, I got my culture from Josh's frogs. It was just a tiny culture, like ridiculously tiny. You guys saw it. And... You know, after a couple of months, this is what I have. It's not something that you are going to be able to feed off right away. But once it's established, this is a never ending supply of food. Like, look at this. My bed is will eat the beetles. They will eat the larva. They will eat the pupa. See all of this darkness? That's just pupa. Just pupa. If I... Let's see, Let's sift some. I wish I had my smaller sifter. Just this much. This is just full of beetles and larva and pupa. Just what I sifted out of that little bunch. It's insane. Um, they don't require a water source. Maintenance is basically nothing, you guys. Uh, this is just wheat flour, and that's it. It's just a tub of wheat flour. And I went ahead and stuck some beetles in it, and then I just left it alone. I don't do any maintenance on this. I mean, I could, I could like clean it out and get all the skins out, but they don't care. I don't care. It's fine. If I feel like, you know, this is turning into a mess and there's not much flour, I'll just throw some more flour in. They don't smell. It just smells like flour. Oh, I need to clean that off in a minute. They are... Good climbers, though, so you have to have a container that has smooth sides. This one does, and so they, they don't get out. That's it. There's literally no maintenance on this. When I want to feed my fish, I come in here. I have some tweezers. I will do this, and then I will look for little worms that wiggle and pull them out. That's it. Or I will sift out a bunch and throw them in a smooth-sided cup and just go dump them in a tank somewhere. No maintenance. At all. It just grows on its own. It doesn't need anything from me. I literally just threw the flower in and that's the last thing I did. It's great. Okay, so now we are going to look at our downstairs cultures. 
We keep them in this cupboard, again, in a tub with mite paper. And this is why. See all that? Yeah. Mite paper, guys. Invest in it. It's not expensive. Down here we keep springtail cultures. Uh, here's another one. Fruit fly cultures. And our grindle worms. Again, these are all really, really simple. I didn't even take these out of the container they came in. These came from Josh's frogs. I also have one I made back here, so we'll take a look at it. Again, just like our cultures upstairs, holes and netting in all of them. This is gross. So this is a springtail culture. All it is is crushed lump charcoal. You throw some water in the bottom. This is RO water out of our tap. We sprinkle some rice on the top and we wet it down. I feed this maybe once every couple of weeks. That's it. That's the maintenance, you guys. I haven't had to add any new water. We just throw rice in it. The springtails like to eat the mold that grows on the rice. You can also use yeast, but rice is just easier. And that's it. They kind of do it themselves. And when you want to harvest, you just pour off this water. And if we can get it to focus. It's like, no, we don't want to. There we go. The springtails come with it. Now I will say something about springtail cultures. These aren't good for adult bettas. I was hoping they would be, but they're too small and they float on top of the water to a point where, no, Bella, why? Hi, Bella. Uh, the springtails don't break the water surface, so the bettas have a hard time finding them. They're too small for adult bettas. However, they are good for betta fry, um, even probably very tiny ones could eat this. Um, but more importantly, better fry that are on brine shrimp. These are relatively the same size, a little bigger in some cases. So it makes a perfect intermediary food between brine shrimp and bigger foods like grindle worms. And it's hilarious to watch them try to eat this stuff. They will hunt them down at the water's edge and you can just see them hunting under the surface trying to find these guys. But like, there's no maintenance. Uh, since these containers here don't have holes in them, all I do is I open this jar once a day in the morning and then close it back up, just letting the air in and out. But I just feed them maybe once a week, usually once every couple of weeks. It depends how fast they eat through the stuff and that's it. That's the only maintenance. Springtails are easy. If the water level ever goes down, I'll throw some more water in it, but that's it. Uh, Grindle worms, a little more complicated, but I have learned something, some things. Goodbye, Bella. Bella, I'll miss you. She'll be fine. She's only going to be in there a minute. Um, again, same private container. This is coconut fiber. Bella, we missed you already. What are you doing? You can buy this stuff in bricks at the pet store. It's just called Eco Earth. You throw this brick in some water and it turns into a bucket of coconut fiber, which we have here. Let me get this open. So you throw water in this and you have a bucket of coconut fiber. Real simple. I just keep this in a sealed bucket. It doesn't go bad. 
if it dries out, you just add more water. But that's all this is. You throw some in the bottom, about that much. Throw your worms in. Now these do require a little bit of maintenance. Every every two, maybe three days, we throw in some cat food. That is not mold, you guys. That is worms. But, but that's it. I throw some cat food in. If it starts to get dry, I missed it a little bit. But that, that's, that's all the maintenance. I have had this, this particular culture probably since January. And I haven't had to do anything with it. Uh, I haven't replaced the dirt. I haven't really had to do anything. It's just, it, it's wet dirt. Well, coconut fiber. Um, when I want to feed, after I've thrown some cat food in there, put this plastic lid on it, you take the lid off, you rinse it in some water, you feed that to your fish. This is all little worms clinging to it. Now, I will say that Grendel worm cultures are prone to mites. I had some mite problems in the beginning, and there's probably still mites in here. You can't avoid them, which is why we have mite paper. Um, I found that if they get too bad, all I do is I throw this, all of this coconut fiber into a giant bowl of you know, dechlorinated water. We have an RO system, so I use RO water. Throw it in there, let it settle, dump the top of the water off because the mites float. Throw some more water in, repeat. You just keep dumping off the top of the water till 99% of the mites are gone. And then you start getting the water out of the coconut fiber. So I will dump as much of the water out as possible and then I will go in with a turkey baster or you know something to pull the water out pull out as much water as you can use some paper towels and just soak it up and it's fine your worms will be okay uh, grindle worms from what I've personally noticed can survive in water for 24 hours so the mites can't they can survive about an hour but the worms can survive 24 hours so don't worry about it get it wet it's fine uh, a lot of people will say you know get this wet to the point where you squeeze it and just a few drops will come out I found it doesn't really matter Ugh, now my hands are dirty I have another culture over here that I cleaned not too long ago. It's super wet. You guys can see the liquid on this. But if you also pay attention, you'll see it moving. They don't care. They will find the surface. They will sit on the surface. And your worms will be fine. They can survive in super wet media as long as it's not like all water as long as they have somewhere to crawl out so like this is super super wet but the surface is relatively dry they're fine they're absolutely fine and the mites hate it they don't like water so you know once every month or two maybe if there's a mite problem I'll wash these out but otherwise leave them alone Every few days, throw in some cat food or some dog food. I've heard cat food works better. That's what I use. And that's it. Uh, you can literally harvest these every day. They reproduce fast. Uh, all of my bettas and my guppies love grindle worms. It's one of my staple parts of their diet. The... 
tiny, tiny griddle worms can be fed to fry. But juveniles and onwards, I say from about four weeks, can eat the adult griddle worms. And they love it. It's super good for them. Let's take a look at some fruit fly cultures. So guys, we actually have a task today. We are going to go ahead and replace my fruit fly cultures. Uh, I had some crash last week, so I went ahead and made some new ones, and they are old. They need to be taken care of, so we're going to make a new one. I'm going to show you how to do it. This is probably the most complicated of all of our cultures, and even then it's not that bad. So this is just a deli cup. If you have a fish room, invest in deli cups. Even if you don't use them for like cultures, I use them for everything. I jar fish in them. I use them to pour water from one container to another. Uh, I hold them to, I use them to hold my live foods for when I'm feeding things. Just, they make great jarring for female battles when you want to put them in with a male. You can use them as temporary fry holders. Just, they're great invest in some. So this is my own recipe that I use for fly cultures. This is half a cup of old-fashioned oats. Go ahead and do all this one-handed. Got it. This is just kitchen paprika. Um, this is a color additive. It works really well for the red and oranges and yellows in betta fish. This is like less than half a teaspoon. Throw that in there. Because if you feed this to your fruit flies and you feed your fruit flies to your bettos, they get it. Uh, if you want to do blue and green, use spirulina. I don't bother with this. Uh, I put spirulina in their other gel food and the snello for my snails. But for flies, I just use that. And then we put half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Cinnamon, one, makes the culture smell good. Uh, two, it helps to prevent mold. You do not want mold in your fruit fly culture. Next ingredient, I do about three capfuls of apple cider vinegar. Give me a second. Okay, so we threw in our three capfuls of apple cider vinegar. New bottle here. Next ingredient, applesauce. I just buy a pack of these and leave them in the pantry. Do about three teaspoons. Can you sweetened or unsweetened? It doesn't matter. Uh, this is basically just to sweeten it for the fruit flies. They really like sweet foods. So, yeah, applesauce is good for you. Throw that in. See if I can get this open one-handed. Oh, I'm magic, you guys. This is yeast. I just have a giant bag of it. Oh, can't. I'm not this talented. There we go. Half a teaspoon. Throw it in. Uh, it's just extra protein. They like to eat it. I also use this in our microworm cultures, which I forgot. They're upstairs. Oh well. I need to reset up one of those two, but not today. So, throw all this stuff together. Chopstick, greatest tool for fruit fly cultures. We stir it all up. Stir it all up. This smells like apple pie. It's great. I need some more water, but then we get some non-chlorinated water. We have our O system, so we do that. Heat this in the microwave for two minutes. 
So we got our hot water. Take half a cup of it. Throw it into your culture. Stir it all up. That is basically it. Let's get this stuff off the sides. Now I'll leave this for a few minutes. And let it cool down not completely but enough that the top looks kind of solid and then I'll take this which is just a ball of ripped up paper uh, some people say to use excelsior or you know wood shavings various things straws I've seen people use but I find this is easiest it's literally just paper just strips of paper throw it in there and you press it down into the oatmeal and once you've got it all set up I usually you're technically just supposed to leave it till it cools down and you throw your flies in it I tend to make these in the morning so I will just set it on my counter go do other things come back at lunchtime and throw my flies in now, let me teach you some tricks. Flies are really good climbers. These are wingless fruit flies. There are several different types. There's fruit flies that, you know, can fly. Don't use those. There's wingless and flightless fruit flies. Flightless fruit flies, flies still have wings, but they can't fly. I use wingless fruit flies because the wings... It's just extra stuff in there for your fish to try and digest that has no nutritional value. And it's just, eh, this is easier. So these are Dropsophilia melanogasters, wingless fruit flies. They're great, they're huge. They are a really good size for adult bettas. Babies cannot eat these. But adult bettas and guppies, Love them. So to harvest these, you tap it, knocks them down, take the clean rat off, wrap off, throw it in here, shake. Your flies will fall right in. You can also put these in the fridge or the freezer for a couple of minutes and it will slow them down, puts them in a state of hibernation and they're easier to work with. But they come out of it really, really fast, and I've gotten really good at just tapping them off. So that's what I do. Now, I will show you a trick. Once these are empty and they need to be cleaned, you take it, whole thing, and throw it in your freezer. Uh, just leave it there for a couple hours overnight if you feel like it take it out the next day it will literally be a fruit fly popsicle <laughs> you can run the bottom under some warm water from your tap and then turn it upside down and the entire contents of this fruit fly culture will fall into your trash magically like a giant popsicle so that's a really easy way to clean it. All that you'll be left with is the eggs around the outside. You take it to your sink, throw it under some water, take a spoon or a knife, and just scrape the sides off. It will come clean right away. And that's it. It makes it really easy to clean because no one wants to be scooping goop out of this. It's nasty. And you have to run it through your dishwasher. No thank you. So freeze it. It will come out in one giant chunk. It's awesome. And that makes sure that all of the, the larvae and the eggs and the fruit flies that are in there are dead. So when you throw them in your trash, they don't explode and hatch all over your house. So I recommend it. Uh, I replace these every three weeks. I keep three cultures. So every three weeks, I just change out 
a different culture every week. So like this week I would change out this one, next week I'll change out this one, the next week I'll change out the next one. And it works perfectly. These overproduce quite a lot of fruit flies, way more than I need to feed my fish. So what I do is every couple of days I look in there, if you've got a lot of flies, this one does. I have a container in my freezer, it's an old butter container, clearly labeled so nobody tries to eat it. And I dump them in here. Sometimes paper falls in, but most of the time you just get fruit flies. Stick it in your freezer, freeze them. Bettas don't care, they will eat them frozen. You can just pull them out and sprinkle them in, into your tanks. Your fish will be happy. Uh, most fruit flies can survive in a freezer for three days, I believe. But Dropsophilia melanogaster, which is the wingless fruit flies I use, cannot. They will survive maybe an hour and then they'll be dead, permanently dead. So that's what I do. And of course, for our last culture I want to talk about. I do not have it down here. It's upstairs. Okay, you guys, one last culture, which we had to, actually two last cultures I had to return to my fish room for. So this is our micro room culture. Currently it is not enjoying the heat up here. I need to take it back downstairs and I need to reculture it. Basically, same as the fruit fly culture. Container, plastic wrap with some holes in the top over it. This substrate I have in here is a mix of half a cup of oatmeal, half a cup of hot water, and you throw in mm, a quarter of a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of yeast. Uh, I also put in half a teaspoon of cinnamon in mine so it doesn't mold. Mix it all together, let it sit. Once it's cool, you take a spoon of culture from my previous microworm culture and spread it around on the top. That's it. Uh, there's no maintaining this at all. I change it every three weeks, so once a month. And I will just take a spoonful out of this culture and stick it in the next one. Um, you can take the old cultures like this and throw them in your fridge. And they will maintain the microworms that are in them for, I want to say it's somewhere between six weeks and six months. I think it's six months. Um... That way, if this culture ever crashes, you can just take a spoonful out of what you have in the fridge and start a new culture again. Uh, it's really easy to maintain. Because I put cinnamon in mine, um, I don't really have to change this out every three weeks. It doesn't get moldy, but I do it anyway. You can also stir these once a week if you want them to maintain well, but I don't bother and it does fine. Uh, about three days after you put microworms into a new culture, they'll be crawling up the sides and they're ready to harvest. So these are super simple to take care of. And when you feed them, you just take a Q-tip or your finger and go around the outside down here by the oatmeal line, scrub around the outside of the container and wash it off in your tank and that will feed your babies. The only other culture we have is vinegar eels, which, let's see, there you go, you can see them moving. I set this up at the beginning of the year. So it's six, seven months old. This is a old wine bottle that is filled halfway with apple cider vinegar, halfway with RO water, or you know, dechlorinated water. 
throw a couple of slices of apples in the bottom and you throw your vinegar eel starter culture in. They need air, so I have a coffee filter rubber banded over the top. And I don't do anything else to this. I leave it alone. It has been going for six months and it's just absolutely teeming with vinegar eels, which are actually like a little tiny microscopic worm. To culture it, I just stick my turkey baster in there, pull some out, stick it in a tank. The little bit of vinegar that you're gonna get out of that is not harmful to your fish at all. It's just, it's fine. You can also throw a piece of cotton in the neck part of your bottle and fill the top with dechlorinated water over that and the little worms will go right up through the cotton up to the top to get air and you can suck them out that way if you're scared of the vinegar but I just throw the vinegar in the tank and it's fine. If it starts to get empty, throw some more vinegar in. That's it. Six months. It's fine. I don't need to redo it. I haven't needed to throw any new apples in it. It runs all on its own. Buffy came to visit us. Obviously, I still have some bottles to wash and cut. So that is it for the end of this video. Those are my cultures. They are super, super easy to maintain. Now, we didn't get into two of my live cultures. I do keep Daphnia and I hatch baby brine shrimp. I don't recommend those for people who are new to this. Uh... Hatching baby brine shrimp is easy. Raising brine shrimp is not, I have learned. Daphnia are so easy to crash. Um, out of all my cultures, I think the ones that I'm the most glad I have is microworms because they're really easy to feed to your baby bettas. The other ones I would highly recommend are rice flower beetle larvae. Super easy to raise. You get bunches of them. You never have to buy fish food again. Um, the wingless fruit flies are another one that's a little bit more maintenance. I think out of all my cultures, they require the most maintenance, but it's still like nothing. Um, they're just so prolific that you get so much food out of them. So I highly recommend those if you can keep them. And grindle worms are my third favorite for adult bettas. Well, you can also feed them to juveniles and fry, but, and of course my last favorite is grindle worms. They're just a great all around food. They're very easy to culture. There's very little maintenance. Um, if you have other pets like cats and dogs, you don't even have to buy them food. You already have the cat food and the dog food on hand to feed your grindle worms, so they're just super, super duper easy. Uh, I will say that after all this time, I don't necessarily recommend springtails because they have such a limited time frame in which you can feed them to your juvenile fry. Uh, they are good for juvenile fry, but for Adult bettas, eh, they're a little too tiny. I don't think they're great for adult bettas. So, I mean, they're super, super easy to culture and keep. So if you have juvenile bettas quite a lot, that's a great food. But I wouldn't recommend them for adults is what I've learned. Um, vinegar eels I could do without. I feed them the first three days to my fry, but microworms are easily the same size and much easier to culture. Well, not to culture, but to harvest. They're much easier, so like, and they're way more nutritious. So I'd rather use those. Mealworms. Mealworms are great if you make gel food. Um, they don't stay as baby mealworms long enough to, I would say, use them as a staple food because it's such a limited window of when they're tiny enough to feed to your bettas, and then they're just huge for most of their life cycle. But it is really easy to just take the mealworms and 
throw them in a gel food or something and still get the nutritional value out of them. And they're super easy to culture. They're very prolific. So I do think it's a good choice, but it's not something I would pick as a staple food. It's more of a food I throw in every once in a while. My staples are definitely rice flour beetles, uh, grindle worms, and wingless fruit flies. They're great. And my fish seem to do really well on them. So, you know, don't be afraid to culture live foods. I know it seems like a hassle. It seems like you need all this thing, all these things. Uh, people think it's gonna be expensive and it can be expensive to get the starter cultures, but then you literally never buy fish food again. It just takes a little bit of maintenance, like five to 10 minutes a day. I do a little bit of maintenance. I do further maintenance for maybe 15, 20 minutes once a week for the most part and another 15 20 minutes every month it's literally nothing uh most of the cultures like mine you see require the same things most of them on mine require oatmeal or flour um it's just, it's really simple. It's easy stuff. Some things just need water <laughs> and cat food, which I already have. You need some plastic containers, but it's, it's super easy to maintain live cultures. So if you can, and you have, you know, a little bit of time, not even that much, five to 10 minutes a day, like you can, easily culture your own foods for your fish and you won't need to buy expensive tiny bottles of processed foods for your bettas. I mean that stuff can be good it has a lot of stuff in it but you could just it's it's easy to culture your own and you know that they're getting live foods you know what they've been fed you know there's not any extra chemicals in it it's just super easy I recommend it so if you can, do it. Highly recommend. I am so glad that that is the journey we decided to go on during this experiment of raising fish. I, I don't regret it at all. And I will admit, sometimes I get lazy. You can see some fish food over there. I do feed flakes to my guppies. Um, we also have some high protein beta crumbles over there that I throw into their gel food just to kind of round it out. So yeah, that's it for today's video, guys. Uh, if you have any questions about live cultures, if you want any advice, if you want anything clarified, go ahead and leave a comment down below and I will happily explain more <laughs> and answer any questions you have. Uh, I've learned a lot doing this. I've learned some tips and tricks. I've learned, you know, what is and isn't necessary. Uh, and I think it's a lot easier than people present it to be. And I think if you don't have an aversion to insects and you can get a tub to keep them in, like, why not? It's fine. They're, they're not going to go anywhere. Don't be scared. I promise. I will see you guys in the next video.